Today's lecture is about uh, the connection between liberalism and Eurocentrism. Liberalism is the philosophy of power, the philosophy of government that uh, we are experiencing now in the United States. Uh, and we uh, start thinking about liberalism and identifying the main thinkers of liberalism uh, when we look at the work of what we call the uh, social contract uh, people, the social contract thinkers. Um, so um, I decided to start this with um, the ideas of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was a Swiss-French philosopher born in 1712 and died in 1788. He's one of the most famous contract thinkers, people who started thinking about the social contract. Um, and he was uh, of French, as I said, French and Swiss origin. So most of his life, was in Paris, uh, where he had a huge influence uh, over many uh, politicians at the time. Um, he was a composer initially, a musician, but didn't have any luck in that field, so he started engaging in philosophy, and his work was very well received, especially some of his novels. Uh, later, because of the political turmoil of France at the time and his very radical ideas, he was banned and sent into exile, but he was able to return to Paris uh, eventually and he died there. Unfortunately, before he died, uh, he became very paranoid and his last days were very sad and in seclusion. He was extremely influential, as I said, over politics at the time, uh, because this is uh, the these are the years ramping up to the French Revolution, and as you know, revolutions start way ahead of the day that we usually uh, date them. Uh, so uh, he uh, was very active in the years previous, and his thinking uh, influenced much of the uh, uh, rulers of the uh, governments post French Revolution. So after his death, his ideas were particularly taken up by the Jacobins, who, uh, who were one of the most radical wings of the French Revolution. But he also influenced later on uh, uh, US philosophers like Ralph Waldo Emerson and Thoreau. Uh, later on, he was very much criticized, though, by Voltaire, and even later on by Popper, Karl Popper, and Hannah Arendt. So, um, as I said, he's one of the uh, thinkers of the social contract, which means that his thought is mostly concerned um, with the relationship between the state and the individual. Uh, what is that connection between government um, uh, in the state and the individuals that empower that government, that empower that state? Um, the thinking of the social contract is revolutionary because it implies that at some point people came up to an agreement and signed some sort of implicit contract to have a government over themselves, to have a state, uh, I should say, that will be uh, more powerful than themselves. Uh, this is important because up to that point, up to the years when this social contract people start thinking, um, mostly folks so thought of government as God-given. Uh, we are talking about medieval ages where people were ruled by kings and nobles who are supposed to be of uh, blue blood, different blood from uh, regular folk, and they could govern over regular people because they were mandated by God. So these contract thinkers really come up with something very revolutionary that is the product of the revolutionary times they are living in. As I said, uh, Rousseau is uh, somebody who's thinking in the years previous to the French Revolution where the bourgeois are becoming very powerful and getting into conflict with the lords uh, who are not allowing the bourgeois to make as much money as the bourgeois know uh, they could make if the nobles got rid of all the weird and complicated laws that made up for medieval age uh, states. Uh, so uh, this idea that we signed a contract amongst ourselves is very revolutionary, but at the same time, it has this connotation that uh, it means that before we signed the contract, we were living in a state of nature. 
So the big deal with Rousseau and the other contract thinkers like Hobbes and Locke is that um, the social contract delivers us from a state in which we're sort of like animals. That's what they mean by state of nature. So before we signed the social contract, we were not really human beings. We were subpar, if you want to, human beings. And the signature of this contract and us giving all this power to the state over us is what characterizes us as civilized human beings which at this point in time, and this is one of the main tenets of Eurocentrism, means that we are better human beings than others because we live in societies that are civilized through the signature of the social contract, uh, which means we've moved away from our prior state of nature, are behaving like animals. Uh, so the contract, and again, the positive uh, part of the contract is that it implies that the ruler, the government, um, the president in our case, uh, or whoever is governing us, the prime minister, is the people's agent, not their master. Again, this is the huge revolutionary thing of the bourgeois. Uh, government is made by the people and for the people. Uh, we don't have a master over us. We have a president, somebody that we elect, and four years later we can bring him back home if we don't like the work they are doing, and we believe that there's nothing special about these people except that we have signed a contract to have them rule over us. So um, this idea of the social contract, again, going a little deeper, is the idea that people empower their state by the contract with the ruler. So I give up much of what I have um, control of, and I put this in, in the hands of the state. Uh, for example, one way to think about this is that if I'm staying at home, and all of a sudden somebody comes into my house and, uh, you know, tries to harm me, well, I have the right to call the police and have the police uh, help me get rid of this person, right? Because I am no longer uh, taking uh, law in my own hands, like supposedly I was doing when I was living like an animal in the state of nature. But I'm saying, well, you know, I signed a contract. I said that the power would go to the state, so I'm not going to use my own force against this person. I'm going to use the state. I'm going to ask the state to do their job and protect me from this aggression. So in the same way, if I want to protect my possessions or whatever, the state would be there to do that for me. And the idea is that in this way, we have somebody who's very powerful over us, but this powerful person will protect the weakest of us, right? So I give up my independent interests uh, and I give all the authority to the state to enforce the collective interest of society. So uh, in Rousseau's idea of the social contract, not in other thinkers that were more conservative than Rousseau, this means that if the ruler acts against the interests of the whole of society, then the contract becomes void. This is very important because this is democracy. Uh, I sign a contract with a ruler and told him you can rule over me, but at the same time I'm saying, well, you can only rule over me if you act in the interest of the whole of society. So you might act against my uh, personal interest if I commit a crime, for example, the ruler has the right, the state has a right to send me to jail. But uh, the state does not have the right to become the jailer of all of society or the majority of society. Uh, the state needs to act in accordance with the interests of society. So this, again, is the interesting uh, progressive uh, side of the social contract. The not so progressive side is uh, the uh, notion that people who do not live under a state uh, like a Western democracy is a state, these people are behaving like animals and they cannot progress. Is so it's problematic because um, at the time that this social contract is being written, uh, these people are looking at folks who live outside of Western societies as living in the state of nature, that is, as living as animals. So uh, when Rousseau talks about the savage, and he's very nice to the savage, he says that he's a better human being than us, happier, happy-go-lucky kind of a thing. But you can almost see Rousseau touching, you know, the head of the savage. 
and uh, being condescending to the savage because he's not as good as we are. He doesn't have a social contract. He doesn't behave like a human being. So this idea of the state of nature that people lived uh, before um, before societies, Western societies were um, created, uh, just pursuing their own unreflective interests, uh, unaware of society's welfare, concerned only with self-preservation, living with no rights and no moral relations to be respected, cooperation was impossible, human character cannot develop, so this is a terrible situation to be in. Although people might be happier, there's really no room for progress. And because there is no room for progress, uh, Rousseau thinks that these people are savages and they uh, will eventually need the help of those who have become civilized by signing the social contract. Um, so um, it's important to notice that he's um, um, looking at uh, this state of nature as a place of um, that needs to be overcome if society is going to develop, because otherwise we cannot cooperate and we cannot um, move forward with what's going on. It, now, the problem here is that he's saying that everybody who's non-Western is living in the state of nature. So that means that if you didn't follow the trajectory of Europe, if you didn't um, uh, start off living uh, by hunting and gathering, then moved on to planting and then moved on to uh, machinery, uh, you are not moving the right way and you're in need of help. So the main elements of liberalism, elected government is not a government that is imposed by the church or by any kind of institution outside of the people. Uh, the church and the state should be separate. Perhaps this is one of the uh, spaces where we see less, uh, least um, development of uh, liberalism worldwide because church and state still are very close. It's also a philosophy that advocates for self-sufficiency and self-reliance. Uh, this means that um, once uh, everybody has the right to access property, this is one of another main tenet of uh, liberalism, one has the ability to be self-sufficient and rely on, one, on one's own. So this is what we hear now, uh, sometimes people refer to as pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. And this is supposedly possible under liberalism because there is no king to uh, take your possessions away from you like they could do during medieval ages. So uh, given that the state is there to guarantee access to private property to everybody, supposedly, then there's no reason for the state or anybody, for that matter, to support the individual when in need. On the other hand, during medieval ages, uh, peasants who worked for the Lord were also sort of like the children of the Lord, and the Lord had a, um, a duty to protect them. In the case of liberalism, because we are moving away from this idea of a God giving us the rulers and we are becoming self-sufficient and independent, the state is not really there to protect people, but to protect access to private property. Because the idea is that if you can access private property, then you are going to be able to access also uh, self-sufficiency and self-reliance, and you will be a whole being. It, when we study Karl Marx, and also next week when we study uh, Olympe de Gouche, we will see that in reality, this was a little bit uh, disingenuous because workers, for example, don't really have an option to create private property in a Marxist sense. As a worker, best case scenario, you will have a good living uh, because of what you can bring home as a salary, but you won't be able to accumulate enough wealth to acquire what Marx calls private property, what makes money uh, to buy a factory, to buy land that will be productive, etc. So this idea that uh, everybody has access uh, to uh, wealth and everybody has access, should be self-sufficient and self-reliant doesn't work very well if you are a salaried worker. It also didn't work very well if you were a woman at the time when these people were thinking. And we will see what Olympe de Gouche thinks about that next week. But for now, we are going to continue talking about liberalism, but in connection with Eurocentrism, 
a philosophy that has been uh, discovered underlying liberalism, if you wish. No liberal, no well-meaning liberal would admit that they are also Eurocentric, but critics of liberalism have discovered that both things go very, very close together. So in order to understand um, um, Eurocentrism, we must first understand history, especially the history of Europe, starting in the 1400. Uh, what we find at that time is that there are a number of European nations, and these European nations grow in time, that uh, become aware that they can go elsewhere, invade other parts of the world, take away their resources, and use them for their own benefit. As outside Europe, people hadn't developed the same uh, degree of um, guns and um, a, other ways of protecting themselves through wars, uh, it was relatively easy for the Europeans to, uh, through brutality, murder, and mass slaughter, invade these nations and take their resources away. Later on, we will see that they start taking also not only resources, uh, but also people, human resources, as we call them now. Uh, so this is the beginning of slavery, right? We see the beginning of slavery, starting with the years when the European nations start uh, building their empires abroad. So the Spanish Empire in the 1400, very quickly after that, the Portuguese also start uh, sailing out of their areas and enslaving other people. Uh, the Pope, and here we see the importance of the Catholic religion in enslaving uh, people of color all over the world, uh, allows for uh, pagans to be enslaved because they are not really people, they are not really human beings. And it takes a long time, it takes several hundred years for the Catholic Church to declare that uh, people living in the, uh, in the colonies, as they called us, uh, were also human beings and not uh, devil worshippers. So we see here that there's a need, an economic need of these European nations to grow in power by ransacking uh, the non-Western world. And at the same time, at the end of the 1600, we see that the Leviathan, one of these first books um, that deal with um, the issues of the social contract and the creation of liberalism is published. So 200 years and when um, slavery, enslavement and colonization and uh, brutality against uh, people of color throughout the world really takes hold, we start finding these first thinkers who kind of sell us liberalism abroad. They're, they're telling us that, well, you know, you have these people that are not uh, as developed as white people. They are still living in the state of nature. They don't have a state. They live like animals. They don't have any kind of moral bounds to what they do. They sleep around with anybody. And a number of nonsense because no human being ever lived without moral rules and obligations. We wouldn't survive without that. Out of just sheer ignorance and the huge impulse to uh, create wealth, they they uh, declare us people living in non-Western parts of the world as being less than human, as being people who needed help to be able to uh, get out of that mythical state where they are just, you know, committing atrocities against each other. But we see all of this when Europe needs to um, justify the brutality, the mass murdering, the enslavement of human beings that do not look like themselves. So Eurocentrism is um, um, deeply ingrained in liberalism. You cannot think of liberalism without thinking of Eurocentrism, which translates into racism, right? So again, it's um, the um, it's a worldwide view that privileges and normalizes the experiences of white Europe. So if you didn't go through the same uh, trajectory that white Europeans went through, you are considered less. So uh, white Europeans believe that first they started by hunter-gathering, then they started planting, 
and then out of this they became uh, the very successful capitalists that we know nowadays. Uh, what they don't tell us is that this trajectory, this European trajectory, is based on the brutalization, um, uh, slaughter, uh, and outright ransacking of the non-Western world. It, we, we never hear, for example, that the Industrial Revolution came to be thanks to the enormous amount of wealth that was discovered in the Americas, particularly the uh, gold and uh, silver that were shipped to Spain first and then through uh, Spain's bad uh, business uh, models end up in uh, the Netherlands. And those banks are the ones that later on fund uh, what we know today as the Industrial Revolution. So uh, what we see today, this huge differentials in power between the European nations, the United States, and the non-Western world, uh, Latin America, the uh, African countries, and other places of the world, these huge differentials uh, were naturalized through this concept of Eurocentrism. Uh, white people were told that um, we were poorer because we couldn't deal with ourselves. We didn't have a social contract that would deliver us from this savagery. So we needed the help of the white European colonizers to help us progress because they envision progress as control over nature. The more you can harness nature with machines or whatever means you have, the more progress you, you are living. Uh, this notion of progress clearly is coming to a huge uh, end uh, nowadays with climate change, but this is the model that white Europeans had in their heads when they looked at the non-Western world. And since non-white um, non people, people of color, what we call today black and indigenous people of color, were, had not developed capitalism, in, most, in some cases they were in some sort of transition maybe towards that, but some of them were just continuing with hunter-gathering practices very happily and with lots of rules on how to live this well, these people had to be shown to us as inferior and in need of help. So that was called by the British uh, the white man's burden, uh, that white men had this need to um, uh, help by enslaving uh, people who were not like themselves because otherwise um, nature was, uh, you know, lying fallow. Nothing was done, as if we needed to do something with nature, right? Uh, so one of the characteristics of Eurocentrism is this idea of dualism. You are either a capitalist or you are pre-capitalist because uh, you have to go that way, right? Uh, there's no other option for them. You are either European or non-European. You are either primitive, a savage, or civilized, like the white man. You are either traditional, primitive, or modern, like the white man. And all of these dualisms are always very favorable to white people and do not take into account other ways of living, other ways of being civilized, if you wish. <laughs>